Picturesque farms and modern healthcare facilities, quaint country stores and bustling industries. This is Greensville County, Virginia, a diverse land that portrays a rich heritage. To commemorate the centennial of Emporia, Greensville's county seat, First National Bank presents a portrait of the past. Very, very ancient Indian artifacts had been found on the lower Meharan, showing that they were prehistoric Indians, 10 to 12,000 years. That was before the Meharan of the Nottoway came in. The Meharan of the Nottoway supposedly arrived about 500 years before Christ. Trade with the Indians was among the principal reasons early trappers and explorers ventured here in 1650. The quest for an efficient trade route from eastern North Carolina and new land for tobacco production were other reasons for early exploration of this area. The man traditionally considered this area's founding father was Captain Robert Hicks. Hicks was not this county's first settler, but he and his family made many contributions that helped transform this fertile yet sparsely populated land into a community. A deed found in Edenton, North Carolina, shows that he purchased his local holdings from Arthur Cavanaugh in 1709. Hicks himself never lived in Hicksford, although the village on the south side of the Meharan bore his name. Hicks was captain of the Frontier Guard and a noted Indian trader, which accounts for the legend of how he traded his hat to the Meharans for the land 20 miles along the river. By the time white settlement became prevalent, the Indians had all but disappeared. In 1780, Greensville County was formed from Brunswick County by an act of the General Assembly signed by Governor Thomas Jefferson. Portions of Sussex County were added later. Most historians agree that the county takes its name from General Nathaniel Green, a revolutionary hero who was instrumental in many patriotic victories in the southern colonies. County officials were sworn in during the first session of Greensville County Court, February 22, 1781. During this time, the people of Greensville County frantically prepared for the coming of the British. Rifle pits were dug near Junction Farm, and trees were cut down to thwart a river crossing. It is also reported that the bridge crossing the river was destroyed. In the end, these measures proved to be no defense against British deception. The Queen's Rangers, under the command of British Colonel John Simcoe, were proceeding south from Petersburg to rendezvous with General Cornwallis. Simcoe's troops wore green jackets, a color donned by many American militia companies. When a Greensville militia officer mistook the Queen's Rangers for Allied forces, the Patriots were completely surprised and unwittingly surrendered Hicks Ford without firing a single shot. After Simcoe left Hicks Ford, Cornwallis's vanguard, Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton, arrived here by way of Southampton County. General Cornwallis arrived later, perhaps spending as long as three days in Hicks Ford. A few weeks later, he surrendered at Yorktown. Based on the fact that Tarleton had raided from the south and Simcoe had raided from the north in advance of Cornwallis's army, people around here got busy during the revolution. They drove their livestock deep into the woods, they hid their food, and they buried everything they had of value. By the time the British got here and Tarleton raided west of Emporia, all they could find, he said, was dry bread. And that's how the Dry Bread Road got its name. An unauthenticated manuscript implies that an armed skirmish took place here and a number of British soldiers were killed. Subsequent discoveries of bodies when Main Street was excavated and further research lend credibility to this paper. Greensville County not only supplied men for the local militia, but also patriots who participated firsthand in America's quest for independence. The records of Georgia and South Carolina had been forwarded to Greensville County for safekeeping. Major James Wall of Hicks Ford recognized the danger of British seizure and supervised an evacuation of the records to Berkeley County, now part of West Virginia. In 1791, President George Washington passed through Hicks Ford on his southern tour. He had breakfast here at Spring Hill. During our nation's formative years, Greensville County gave America whatever was requested of her. Early residents saw action in the wars and conflicts that shaped the destiny of our country. Considering the number of men per capita Greensville County sent to serve, ours is a truly proud tradition of patriotism. 
Greensville County produced several men who distinguished themselves in the affairs of the Commonwealth and the country. Henry Taswell became a successful lawyer, judge, senator, and president of the U.S. Senate. His son, Littleton Waller Taswell, became a senator and governor of Virginia. John Young Mason was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates in 1823. In the years that followed, he served as a congressman, judge, attorney general, secretary of the Navy, and envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to France. The tremendous drain on the land from constant tobacco production became evident in the early 1800s, and our farm-intensive economy diversified by turning toward other sources of income, including pork production. The distilling of apple brandy was also a major source of revenue, and Greensville County was known for the high-quality quarter horses it produced. Local horse breeding got its roots in the last quarter of the 18th century. John Willis, a man of considerable fortune, owned a fine plantation and a number of well-bred racing horses. In 1774, William Edwards purchased the famous racehorse Fear Not and brought him to this area to stud. The stallion lived here until his death in 1776 at the ripe old age of 21. Fear Not's spirit and blood were evident as he sired many quality racers. One critic said, Fear Not was one of the most distinguished stallions ever in America. William Edwards established what later became known as Belfield Racetrack, located near Edwards Ordinary, his elegant tavern. In 1797, Edwards' son, Isaac, sold the Ordinary to surveyor Belfield Stark. The tavern later became known as Butts Tavern, and the town became Belfield. Until Butts Tavern was destroyed by fire in the 1960s, it served as a private residence, school, and entertainment facility for many decades. A 1797 Act of the General Assembly established Belfield, with an act two years later establishing Hicksford on the lands of Alexander Medill and Joseph Spencer. These two communities would eventually unite to form Emporia. The first charter for a railroad in Greensville County was granted in 1830. The railway viaduct built in 1853 was considered a major architectural achievement. While Belfield and Hicksford were modest in population, several inns and taverns prospered because Halifax Road served as a major supply line between North and South. This area did not possess the large plantations that the Deep South was known for, however it did employ the slavery system. In 1831, Nat Turner's insurrection in Southampton County sparked panic in the hearts of many. Belfield and Hicksford served as a haven when scores fled here in fear of their lives. Women and children were heaped on the floors as there was simply not enough room to accommodate them all. General William H. Broadnax reporting from Greensville County. In numerous instances, females with their children fled in the night with but one imperfect dress and no provisions. I found every hovel at Hicks Ford literally filled with women and children. The charity of the few residents of the village would have been greatly inadequate to their support. Many of these refugees seem willing to suffer starvation itself rather than return home. This event forecast an episode in our nation's history in which Southside would play a major role. By the mid-19th century, the feeling that war between the North and South was inevitable had spread throughout the United States. The people of this area believed that the southern states had a right to declare independence. This belief led to the spilling of a great deal of blood on our county. The war between the states touched this area many times. At least three minor raids were made within Greensville County, though little is known about them. In late 1864, a formidable Union force of many thousands marched towards Hicksford from Petersburg. These forces were bent on the destruction of the Weldon Railroad, a vital link between the southern states and Lee's army at Petersburg. They were successful in destroying 16 miles of track north of the city. Village View and Hicksford served as the meeting place of the Confederate leaders, while Confederate General Wade Hampton headquartered at Midfield. In the end, hundreds of soldiers from both sides lost their lives. While Union troops were unsuccessful in taking the Belfield Bridge, they burned and looted many homes in Greensville County. Four months later, the bloody conflict was over, as Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. As important as this area was as a link in the supply line, its greatest contribution to the Confederacy was that of many brave men who had an insatiable desire to defend the causes they felt to be sacred. Among our heroes 
were William Henry Briggs, who would later become a distinguished educator, William Peter Weish, who captured an officer of the battleship Congress at the Battle of Hampton Roads, and General John Randolph Chambliss, Jr., whose troops contributed considerably to many Southern victories. Greensville County also contributed medical aid to the war effort, including the talents of Dr. George Mason, who owned and operated the girls' school, The Homestead. Reconstruction for Greensville County, as throughout the South, was slow and painful. Many residents were stripped of their rights because of their sentiments during the Great Conflict. Some of the county's old families, with almost nothing remaining, chose to leave. Others stayed to try to restore order from chaos. The local economy was virtually at rock bottom, but this era too came to a close. When the Atlantic and Danville Railroad came to Belfield, it was agreed that Hicksford and Belfield be united. On April 28, 1887, the two communities became one. The name Emporia was suggested by Benjamin D. Tiller, a local merchant and delegate to the House of Representatives who was a business associate of U.S. Senator Preston Plum of Emporia, Kansas. As the 1800s progressed, so did Emporia's economy. Many new faces came to Greensville County from other regions. Where natives saw trees, these new citizens saw lumber, an opportunity. The Emporia Manufacturing Company was founded and became one of the largest lumber industries in eastern Virginia. Agriculture continued to be an important part of the local economy, as did the railroad. Many women opened boarding houses or became milliners, and horse racing enjoyed resurging popularity. Races were held here regularly until World War II. The early 1900s saw commerce continue to flourish, banks open, and a newspaper founded. The year 1900 also witnessed the most brutal spree of crimes ever committed in Greensville County. A series of robberies and murders in our area resulted in the arrests of Walter Cotton and David Brandt O'Grady. On March 24th, the citizens of the quiet village of Emporia evolved into an unruly mob. Before the day was half over, Cotton and O'Grady would be lynched on the courthouse lawn. In the aftermath of the deaths of Cotton and O'Grady, a local National Guard unit was organized. A decade later, a shot fired halfway around the world echoed across the south side, calling these native sons to battle. World War I had begun. Greensville natives performed admirably in this war to end all wars. E.E. E. Goodwin became renowned as the most distinguished soldier from Greensville County since General Chambliss, rising to the rank of colonel by the war's end. Chaplain Thomas Bulla also answered the call of duty, ministering to the soldiers and endangering himself in daring rescues of the wounded. Bulla had the tragic distinction of becoming the only chaplain of a Virginia regiment to lose his life in the war. The large stained glass window in the sanctuary of the First Presbyterian Church honors his memory. The chapel also bears his name. These were not the only Emporia natives to fight in the war. Greensville County stands proudly in contributing far beyond its quota of fighting men to defend democracy. After the war came exciting times for Emporia and Greensville County. Airplanes made their first appearance over our city, while on the ground, commerce began to get back on track. New financial institutions were founded, new businesses began, and everyone enjoyed post-war prosperity during the Roaring Twenties. Roads were paved and autos became commonplace. It was during this period that Emporia started to become recognizable as the city it is today. Then came the stock market crash in 1929. During the Great Depression, this area didn't suffer as greatly as some others. We had a strong timber and agriculture community. For the most part, people grew what they ate and life was reasonably normal. That's not to say money wasn't tight. A lot of people labored long and hard for practically no wages, but we had a close-knit community and people knew they could depend on each other. Although efforts were made to soften the economic pressures of the Depression, in the end, it was the deeds of a madman that caused our factories to begin churning out goods again. These were not products for consumers, but for war. World War II again drew on the rich military tradition of Greensville County.
The Japanese raid on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 created the first Greensville County casualty of the war as James Fisher died on the battleship Arizona. Rationing became the norm, but the people in Greensville County were committed to the war effort. Air observation posts were built in Purdy, Trago, Jarrett, and Emporia. Federal funds were appropriated to build the airport. While many young men fought and died overseas, civilians contributed their skills in local Red Cross, manufacturing, and observation efforts. Thomas Cato Tiller, a young ensign from Greensville County, gathered intelligence about the coast of Leyte. The morning of September 12, 1944, pilots of Halls' fleet were bombing an airfield on the island of Cebu in the Philippines. I found myself caught in a dogfight with six Japanese Zeros. I shot one down, but got hit in the process. I had to make an emergency landing in the water. I inflated my life raft and waited for some type of rescue. I was taken to a small island by some natives in outrigger canoes. A young man who spoke some English took me to the native village. I learned that the islanders had no love for the Japanese. When World War II ended, Emporia looked with pride at the achievements of its many heroes yet recalled with sorrow the lives of 33 local men that were lost. In the 40s, the first peanut festival was held in Emporia, saluting the agricultural significance of the peanut in Virginia. It attracted hundreds who came to appreciate the beauty and productivity of our county. Late in the 40s, the Washington Senators located a professional baseball team in Emporia. This was not the first professional team in Greensville County, but the Little Nats captured not only the hearts of Emporians, but the Virginia League pennant in 1949. Greensville County native Howard Fox, now president of the Minnesota Twins, remembers that team. Uh, we had an outstanding year. We had a, a playing manager named Smut Adderholt. And as I remember, uh, in that year, he, he had a fantastic record of hitting over 400 and stealing 77 bases. He hit about 35 home runs and drove in about 140 runs, which was outstanding. We had a uh, left-handed pitcher named Doc Stater, who was a, a full-blooded Indian that was uh, destined to be a great major league ball player. And then he, I think he won 20 games for us. And after he left our ball club, he went to Chattanooga and he, and he hurt his arm and, and he never recovered. The 50s were a time for growth and change in Emporia. Weldon Mills was completed, bringing employment to hundreds, a new high school building was dedicated, and a local radio station was founded. Greensville County became the focus of national attention as local residents pooled their resources in an attempt to invent a wingless airplane. It was built at Klugel & Sons Tin Shop. Thousands of spectators, including representatives of the national press, jammed Emporia Airport Friday, June 10, 1955. To the crowd's dismay, however, this rocket airship was an idea that, quite literally, never got off the ground. In 1965, Georgia Pacific Corporation founded its Emporia plant. This plywood manufacturer gave continuous employment to hundreds of local residents. In addition to the expansion of our local industry, even a touch of Hollywood came to Emporia. June Harding, a graduate of Greensville County High School, starred in the film The Trouble with Angels. She visited Emporia for the local premiere at Pitt's Theater. The recession of the early 80s hit this area with a fury. Many businesses were forced to cut back or close down completely. However, the recent openings of the Purdue Distribution Center, Georgia Pacific and Skippers, and the growth of many local businesses seems to herald the coming of a new age of brighter times for Emporia and Greensville County. This city and county's contributions to religion, medicine, military, education, and commerce are far too numerous to detail. Ours is a county rich in legend, rich in tradition, and rich in heritage. From the legends of Captain Hicks to the contributions of educator Edward Wyatt, we all have a great tradition to build on and a great deal to look forward to in our future.